Our message today comes out of Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. And I want to go there right now at the start. So please, if you have your Bibles, open it with me. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 20. This is a familiar, a familiar po portion of scripture. When you are there, say amen with me. Amen. Hallelujah. Beginning at verse 20. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto him, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when ye pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Hallelujah. The Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. I feel our message today is an instructive one. Let me begin, in by, begin by saying that genuine biblical faith is a miracle in itself. You see, faith is not something that we possess naturally. In fact, Ephesians tells us that faith is a gift from God. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. You see, God enables us to believe in him for salvation. And then he gives every believer a measure of faith. To say it another way, God empowers us to believe him, to serve him, to glorify him through the power of the faith that he gives to us so that we can worship him. And the outworking of faith in God's people has allowed them to see demonstrations of God's power that literally boggles the mind. It has allowed them to receive answers to prayers for things that have appeared impossible. And these miracles of faith are included in God's word to encourage us. In faith, Joshua spoke to the sun, and it had to stop in the, in the air until the Israelites can defeat the Amorites. In faith, King Hezekiah, when he was told that he was going to die, turned to the wall and prayed, and God added 15 years to his life. Abraham was told to sacrifice his son Isaac who was the son of promise. And in faith, he obeyed God's word, and God spared his son and provided a ram, a ram for the sacrifice. At 85 years old, Caleb believed God for the power to defeat a mountain that was infested with giants, and God honored his faith and gave him the mountain. Hallelujah! Teenage boy, David, Believe God for the power to defeat a giant. And God answered his faith and gave him the victory. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed God that will, he will keep them. And in faith, they defied the king, the pagan king. And God met them in the furnace and saved them. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you that faith is going to bring the victory. Hallelujah. And if you read chapter 11 of Hebrews, chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith. You have heard of the Hall of Fame? Well, chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith because in there you would see many more examples of faith being demonstrated and victories being won. But these are enough, what I've mentioned to you, are enough to teach us about the power, the power of biblical faith. And the passage we have just read magnifies the power of big biblical faith. You see, on Monday of the Lord's Passion Week, Jesus was walking towards Jerusalem, he with his with disciples, and he cursed that fig tree. 
Tuesday morning they were going again and the fig tree had died. And when Peter mentions, he says, Lord, the master, the tree which thou cursed have died. Notice with me, Jesus uses this experience to teach his disciples about the power of biblical faith. And when we, you see, when we exercise biblical faith in God and his promise, we can ex expect amazing results. But let me point out that the key to that statement I've just made is the phrase biblical faith. Hallelujah. A lot of people think that just faith, that faith is a blank check. They believe they can ask for anything and there that they desire and God is obligated to do all that they ask of him. But this is not what the Bible teaches and this is where I want to take you this morning. Hallelujah. I want you, this is the focus of our message, the rest of the message. The passage has much to teach us about the power of biblical faith. So I want you to concentrate there. Notice with me first, the object of biblical faith. When the disciples are amazed at the withered fig tree, Jesus simply says, have faith in God. And the emphasis of that command is that God's people should have a deep, settled, consistent, ongoing confidence in who God is, of what God has said, and what God will do. It speaks of a constant communion of prayer with God, dependence upon God, and obedience to God. When Jesus says, have faith in God, the critical words there is, in God. Hallelujah. Do you notice that he did not just say, have faith. He said, have faith in God. You see, faith has to have an object. Amen. And in God is where we must place our faith. That is where we, our belief must lie. Faith has no value of its own. By itself, only the object of faith has value. And that object must be God. Hallelujah. The Bible never says to just have faith in faith. Yet this is the experience of so many people. Too often, when a difficult situation arises, we feel that we must arouse our faith. We feel that if we can just stir up enough faith, we can whip the problem. But in reality, what we are doing is having faith in faith. And that is not what God tells us to do. Our minds, our attention, and our heart must be focused on God. When we come to God for healing, we, our focus must be on God. Not our faith for the healing, but in faith in the God who is able to bring the healing. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, faith has no power. It is the object of that faith that has the power. Your faith is not going to move the mountain. It is God that is going to move the mountain. Hallelujah. And the strength of faith is not faith. The strength of faith is God. And in the Bible, practically everyone who came to God had weak faith. There were few who had strong faith. Yet we see God saved them and he granted their requests. So when Jesus tells us to have faith in God, he is encouraging us to, to put our faith in several aspects of God's character. The first I want to point out to you, that our faith must be grounded in God's person. Our faith must be grounded in God's person. You see, if you are saved, God is your father. And as your father, he cares about your every need. He says, cast your care upon him for he cares for you. As your father, he invites you to bring your needs and your burdens and your cares to him. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. Amen. He invites us to come boldly unto his throne room where we would find grace to help in our time of troubles. As your father, he desires to open up his resources and give them to you. He says to us, fear not little flock, for your father wants to give you the kingdom. Yes, yes, yes. God wants to give us his resources. Yes. You see, we are not dealing with some distant deity who doesn't care about us. No, our God loves us and he wants us to come to him on the basis of simple childlike faith. And like a child who trusts his parents to provide his every need, you and I as children of God can trust our Heavenly Father. 
So our faith must be grounded in who God is. He is my father. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our faith must also be grounded in God's promises. When it comes to the matter of faith and approaching God in prayer, we have some very precious promises. God invites us to call to him in prayer. God promises to hear us when we pray. God says he will answer our prayers. But when it comes to the promises of God, we have the Lord's guarantee that he can keep and fulfill every one of them. I'm talking about the promises of God. God will not back away from a single promise that he has given to his people. He is more than able to perform that which he has promised. Right? And prayer and faith is not a blank check, church. Prayer and faith is an opportunity for God's people to demonstrate their confidence in the promises of his written word. When God sends something in his word, we can have absolute faith that he will do what he says. Amen. When we pray outside of the will of God, we cannot be sure that he's going to answer because we do not know what is God's will in that matter. Amen. Faith is always based on a clear word from the Lord. Amen. Romans 10, faith commit by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So while it might be right for us to pray about every matter in our life, it is wrong to expect that God is going to do just what you ask. God honors faith, but genuine biblical faith is always based on the word of God. Always. So God, our faith must rest on God's person. It must rest on God's promises. It can also be, it must always be grounded also in God's power. It's one thing to make a promise. It is another thing to have the power to keep that promise. And as children of God, we can have absolute confidence in God's power to do everything he has promised to do. He has the power to do anything we ask him to do. He has the ability to do everything he pleases to do. We serve an awesome God. A God who possesses all power in heaven. He reminds us. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Amen. He tells us. He is able to do abundantly and exceedingly above all that we can ask or think. Jeremiah reminds us. That there is nothing too hard for God. He tells us in Isaiah. That he measured the waters in the hollows of his hand. He meted out the heavens with a span. He complicated. He fixed. He did everything. God is telling us that he can do anything. I have a father who can do everything and anything. So my faith must be grounded in his power. Our faith must also be grounded in his purposes. When it comes to faith in God, we must always remember that he has an eternal plan and he is working to accomplish that plan. Amen. Amen? He has a purpose and everything in the universe, even our requests, are subject to his will. Amen. He will do nothing outside of the bounds of his eternal purpose. He will do nothing that is not part of his plan. He will do everything we ask, but not just because we ask it. Hallelujah. Except it fits in his plan. He will do those things that he wills to do. And he will accomplish all things that he has willed to do. He has said, my counsel shall stand. And I will do my pleasure. What am I trying to do here today, church? I'm trying to bring your understanding to the word of God. We need to stop living by guess. We need to base all of our yeah, all of our faith on the written word of God. Amen. We must ground our faith in his person, in his power, in his purpose. We must ground our faith in God. Amen. Amen. And a lot of people believe that they can ask for anything they want and that God has to do what they ask him to do. Nothing could be further from the truth. Prayer is, prayer is never about getting what we want from heaven. It is all about getting what God wants to do in, on the earth. So we must 
ground our faith in God, nowhere else. Amen? So see also with me the opportunities of biblical faith. Let's read chapter verse 23 and 24 again. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. I want you to see the opportunities also of biblical faith. Biblical faith allows us to believe the impossible. From where Jesus was standing with his, with his disciples, they were able to see the Mount of Olives, and they were able to see the Dead Sea. And he was giving them a very vivid illustration. He was using a familiar Jewish parable, a proverb, to teach them a deeply spiritual truth. You see, the Jews had a term they used. When they spoke of moving a mountain, they were speaking of something that was impossible to do. And there are so many situations in life that appear homeless or are hopeless. There are people that seem to lo so lost that they will never be saved. There are needs that appear so great that they will never be met. There are problems so big it appears that they will never be overcome. But I want to tell you that faith in God Amen. and in the purposes that are found in his word, his promises, allow us to believe God for the impossible situations. I can have faith in God for the salvation of that lost soul. Why? Because he tells me that he desires that every lost person come to repentance. I can have faith for that. That's a promise in the word. Yes. Hallelujah. I can have faith that God will meet that need which is impossible. Because he tells me that. He says, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. He tells me that. I can believe that. Amen. Amen. I can have faith that I am saved. Because he says, whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. I can believe that. I can have faith that I am secure in him because he tells me he holds me in his hands and no man can pluck me from there. I can have faith that there's a place called heaven because he says I've gone to prepare a place for you and I'm coming back. I can have faith that he will never leave me alone because he says I will never leave you or forsake you. I can have faith. Why? Because these are promises that are grounded and rooted in the word of God. And that's where I'm putting my faith. And the list could go on and on. But faith in God and his promises allow us not only to believe him for those things that appear impossible to us. It also allows us to receive that impossible thing. Jesus said that if we could believe him, we would have what we asked for. Faith has the remarkable ability to enable us to hold in our hands things that have not yet been seen. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. The word substance there means foundation or that which stands under something. Faith is the guarantee, the assurance that we will have the things that God has promised to us. And the word evidence there means conviction. And in modern language, it refers to what we will call the smoking gun. Faith allows us to hold in our hearts things that are yet to appear. And the faith described in this amazing verse is the absolute God-given present confidence of a future reality. It is the conviction that what we have believed by faith is already ours even though we yet don't see it. This is the faith that gives substance to the promises of God in our future. Amen. The things that we are hoping for. We are hoping for Christ's return. But God promises that Christ will return. Amen. Amen? Amen? We can hope for the resurrection of the dead because his word promises that. We can hope for, hope for our future glorification because the word tells us that in the end we will be glorified. Amen. We can hope. That we will reign with Jesus. Because Timothy tells us, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Revelation tells us that we will reign with him forever. I am telling you, child of God, if you put your faith, that's where you need to put your faith. In the promises of God. Amen. Stop living my guess. Stop claiming things that God has not promised. Amen. Amen. Because when you do that, you, 
according to the scripture, you pierce yourselves with many things. And you become discouraged. Because you're looking for this thing to happen. And God has never promised it. Faith in God and his word makes the future promises present realities. Heaven is real to me today because the word of God tells me it is. The resurrection is real to me today. My future glorification and eternal change are real to me today. These things are real, not because I have seen or experienced any of them, but because God has promised them to me and he has given me the faith to believe them. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has given us a measure of faith. And if we would put that faith in the right place, we would live victorious lives. All of these things and many more besides, they seem impossible to our minds. Yet they are real because God has given to them, given them to us by faith. Thank God for the power of genuine biblical faith. And some of you here are holding the unseen things of tomorrow in your hands. Even though you have not seen them because of your awesome faith that God has given you. You have put your faith in the promises of God and he is going to make them, he's going to bring them to fruition because God is not a man that he should lie. When God promises something, he's well able to do it and he will in his time. Hallelujah. God has confirmed these promises in your heart and you are just waiting for him to fulfill them. Stay right there. Just hold on to the promises. Amen. And it was going to come. Amen. Notice also the obstacles of faith. While Jesus points out the object of faith and the opportunities of faith, he also mentions in, this, in these few verses some obstacles that can hinder our faith. While faith in God is powerful and allows us to experience the incredible and receive the impossible, that faith oftentimes can be hindered. And there are many other obstacles in the Bible, but I want to focus just on a couple of them that we see here in the word. In verse 23, he says, and shall not doubt in his heart. That speaks of unbelief. Doubt is a deadly, it's deadly to effective prayer. The word doubt means to be divided in your thinking, to hesitate, to draw back. When we pray from a heart of doubt, we are drawing back. From the matter, we are drawing back from the promises of God. You see, because God calls into doubt calls into question the character and the ability of our God. When you say, I know what God said, but I do not believe it in this matter. Doubt says, God may have promised it, but I don't believe He can do it or will do it. But James tells us. Let not the doubting man think he will receive anything from God. When you come to God in faith that we are talking about, biblical faith, true, genuine biblical faith, and you put the promise, your, your, your faith in the promises of God, God is going to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. You might not see it happening in the time that you want to have it, but God will do it in his time. Because he cannot lie. So don't doubt. When you pray, selfishness, whatsoever things you desire. The word desire there means to ask, to beg, to call for, to request. It sounds like a blank check. It sounds like you can ask for anything and receive it. But I want you to remind that that's not what the scripture says. Hallelujah. There is not a single verse in the Bible that contradicts itself. And the Bible is clear that answers to prayer come when we pray according to the will of God. Amen. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And that he is going to give us what we ask for him from him when we pray according to his will. Amen. Prayer must always be based on what God wants and not what you want. When we pray in Jesus' name, we did a lot of that this morning. We are not using some magic formula that guarantees that God is going to do what we ask of him. We are not just to close our prayers by saying in Jesus' name and then believe that God is going to do what we just asked of him. 
You see, to use Jesus' name is to pray for things that Jesus himself would pray for. It is to pray for his purposes and his will to be fulfilled and not our old selfish reasons. It is to petition God on the basis of Christ's righteousness and not our own. It is to pray for his glory alone. Our Father which in art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. We are to pray that God will have his way and his will and his purpose will be accomplished. You see, it is like you getting power of attorney. When you are given power of attorney over someone else's affairs, you are given the right to make decisions on their behalf. It does not mean that you can do anything you want with their resources. It means that you can act in their best interest, always remembering that their name and their reputation is at stake. And when we pray selfish prayers, that are based solely on what we want in a situation and not on his will, we can expect that those friends will not be answered. Because we are praying selfishly and not according to his will. James says you ask and you receive not because you ask a miss so that you can consume it on your lust. Joshua, Caleb, and all the others who received big answers in their prayers from God did so because they were asking for things that God had already promised. And when we ask what God has promised, he is obligated to do. He's fulfilling his word, not ours. Amen? Amen? Does God ever answer prayers that are out of his will? I, sometimes we see it in the word of God. But that doesn't mean that we can demand from God something that is not in his will and expect to have it. That is not the norm. We see also unforgiveness. Jesus commands his disciples to forgive those who have wronged them. Now you might say on the surface, what, does, what is the connection between faith and unforgiveness? Well, I think the connection is found in the matter of prayer. Just as faith connects God with us and enables our prayers to get true, unforgiveness stands as a barrier between us and God. And the unforgiving spirit Puts, it, puts, puts us at odds with God. He has forgiven all of our sin and he expects us to do the same for those who have wronged us. And when we possess an unforgiving spirit, our prayers will be hindered and God's forgiveness will not be realized in our daily work. We will walk through this life out of God's will and out of touch with God. And I say to you, that's a terrible place to be. Where is your faith today? In light of all we have said, how is your faith? Where is it placed? What are you hoping for? What are you believing for? What are you praying for? Are you praying sensibly? Are you praying according to the word of God? Are you praying God's promises? God is not obligated to answer anything that he has not promised. When he says, he promises us healing. He says, if you are sick, call the elders of the church and let them anoint you with oil and let them, and the prayer of the righteous will avail much and you will be healed. But you see, there are conditions right there. Right there. Are the prayers righteous? The prayers of the righteous will bring your healing. It's not just anybody prayers that is going to bring your healing. God's word says, let the righteous pray and day you will receive healing. Are you walking in faith? Believing God for the unseen? Are you looking to him to move some big mountain in your life? Are you seeking his will for every situation in your life? Are you basing your very life on the promise and the purpose and the, and, and, and the power of your God? Come on, church. Let us begin to live sensibly. Let us begin to pray and ask the promises of God and not what he has not promised. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I pray that the Lord will strengthen your faith and you will become more immersed in this Bible. 
that you are going to be, begin to base your life on what God has said and not what other people tell you. Amen. Let us become mature Christians. The word of God says that my people perish for lack of wisdom. Wisdom is found in the word of God and in his promises. So let us get back there. Amen. I pray that the Lord will have to strengthen your faith. And he will if you will just ask him. Stop demanding things from God. And come humbly before him. And beg if you have to. But make sure you are begging according to his will. You have a mountain in your life that leads move, moving today. Come in faith. He has promised that he will move mountains for you. Come bring the mountain. Lay it before him. Make sure it's a mountain that he says he will remove. Amen. Uh, maybe you just need to be saved. And if that is the case, God is ready. He is willing. He is able. He has said unto you, come. He has called you to come. You can come and you can bring your needs before him. And God has promised that he will meet you. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Hallelujah. And thank you for listening.